This is video number 19 concerning um, various topics in quantum mechanics. We want to remind you that um, the playlist for all the videos is not uh, on YouTube or at the YouTube channel. Rather, the playlist is at digital-university.org. Okay, in this video, we want to consider the expectation value of a particular um, quantum operator. Before we do that, let's just think in classical sense what the average of something means. Suppose, for example, that we had a class was taking a test, and this was the distribution of the test scores. Four people scored an 80, six an 85, three had 90, and one of them had a 100. So, of course, to get the average test score, we would add them all up and divide by 14. When we say add them all up, that would mean we'd have 80 times 4 plus 85 times 6 plus 90 times 3 plus 100 times 1, then divide that whole sum by 14 to get the average score. And then if we just did a crude um, graph representation where this axis represents the score, and this axis represents the number of people that attained that score, then if we were at 80, four people obtained an 80. If we were at 85, six people had a score of 85, three people had a score of 90, one person had a score of 90 of 100. So just a crude graph then of the scores and the number of people that attained those scores obviously would look something like this. Well, now for the average we said it would be 4 times 80 plus 6 times 85 plus 3 times 90 make our pluses bigger, plus 1 times 100, and that's divided by 14. Now, in quantum mechanics, what we call the expected value, which really should be called the average value of a um, observable, that's analogous to, like, this numerator part of what we consider classically to be the average. Um, and then this graph of where we have a particular score and the number of people that attain that score, that's going to be instead represented by a particular value, particular lambda values, where these are the eigenvalues of the observable. And remember, it's the eigenvalues that are the observable quantities, because for observables, they correspond to permission operators. And for permission operators, all the eigenvalues are real. And therefore, it's the eigenvalues that correspond to things that we can observe and measure, like momentum, spin, position, etc. So, for the expectation value, what we're going to see is for each particular eigenvalue, that is, for each particular value of something that we're measuring, there's going to be a certain probability associated with it. So, it might look something like this, where these are the eigenvalues, and then this is the probability axis somewhat analogous to what we had here, where these were the scores that were found in the test, and then these were the number of people that had the scores in those particular numbers. So let's just see how all this happens. Suppose that we have an observable, say, k.
an observable operator. So if it's an observable, that means this must be Hermitian. And if it's Hermitian, then that means it has a complete set of eigenvectors. And all the eigenvectors are orthogonal, and they can also be made to be orthonormal. And they are also complete. So from the eigenvectors that correspond to this Hermitian observable, we can form a basis of orthonormal vectors. So this operating on one of its eigenvectors, say i, that would be equal to just lambda i times this. This, of course, is just the definition of eigenfunction and eigenvalue. And this eigenvalue is real because for an observable, this is her mission, and it's these real eigenvalues then that correspond to observables, whether it's position, spin, momentum, whatever. Well, now let's take a state vector. We'll call it psi. And as we discussed, I think it was in video number nine, the state vectors here are composed of complex functions. And with all those functions together, they completely describe the state of the particle at, at any moment in time, or how it changes at any moment in time. Well, what happens then if we take the inner product, say, of the state vector, with our observable operator k, like this. This would be equal to then, we would have the bra of the state vector, and we would have our observable. But now we can do something else. Remember from video one that the identity operator is this, where we have orthonormal basis in this kind of a configuration, and we're summing that over i. So what we can do then, we can say, well, this, then at, when we're at this point right here, corresponding over here on this side of the equation, we can insert this. So we're going to have, at coming after k then, we have this, and then comes psi. And this has to be summed over i. Now, what do we have? We have here k operating on ni, but that just gives us lambda i times that. So now that will equal this expression. Summed over i, we have this. And then from here, we just have lambda i times this from up here. So now we're going to have this. like this, and here is psi, times lambda i. So this expression comes from this expression where this times this is just lambda i times that cat vector. Now let's look at what we have. Here, this and this are complex conjugates of each other.
So what this is, this is a sum over I of this inner product, psi and I squared times lambda I. Because this and this are complex conjugates of each other. Multiply by the complex conjugate and you get this squared. But what does this mean? Well, as we discussed in video number nine, when you take the inner product of the state vector with some other quantity, usually what you get is the probability of something or the probability of something occurring. Here, we're taking the inner product of the state vector with a basis vector of an operator. So what this is giving us is when that, when that is squared, that gives us the probability that the system has an eigenvalue of lambda i. And then when we do this for all the basis vectors, not just for i, but we have a whole complete set of basis vectors that core, or a whole set of eigenvectors that correspond to this, and from that eigen, from those orthogonal eigenvectors, we can normalize them to get a complete set of basis vectors. We were just doing it just with one of them. Now we can do it with all of them as we're summing over i. So what we have found is that this psi k psi equals this inner product squared times psi i. So what this represents right here is that these would be different lambdas, lambdas of different values, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, and so forth. And then this is the corresponding probability of finding a lambda of that particular value. So for lambda 1, it would have a certain probability of occurring. Same thing for lambda 2. Lambda 3 might be different. Lambda 4 might be different. So this axis are the different eigenvalues that can be found, and then this is the probability. For this axis. So what we are getting is a sum of each eigenvalue times its associated probability of occurring. And we're adding them all up. And that is the what is called the expected value of the operator, and this is how it's obtained right here. And again, this graph right here, where we have a certain value, a certain eigenvalue, and associated probability of occurring, another eigenvalue, and the probability of obtaining that particular eigenvalue, and so forth, that is very much analogous to what we discussed earlier here, where we had test scores where those who got 80, that was 4, the number of people that scored 85 was 6, and so forth. And when we get the average, what do we do? We take the number of people that had a score of 80, 80 times 4, 85 times 6, 90 times 3, 100 times 1, that's that numerator, and that is what we are doing right here. Only here, of course, now we're dealing not with test scores, but with different eigenvalues and the probability 
of a particular eigenvalue occurring. And a particular eigenvalue then corresponds to a, a particular measurement that we can take. So in quantum mechanics, that is what is meant by the expectation value. As you can see, it has strong counterparts. It's what we just consider the average in everyday um, classical uh, mathematics and mechanics. Okay, that's it for this video. Um, in the next video, we want to consider the time evolution of an operator. So come back, join us for that video, and we'll continue along with our discussion.